Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this advanced reinforced concrete design. We are now entering into the module uh, seven, and uh, we are going to discuss about uh, how to design, uh, how to analyze and design reinforced concrete elements for torsion. And uh, this will have three parts. Uh, first, we are going to talk about behavior of RC members in torsion. Then we will talk about IS-456 provisions for torsion. And then finally, we will also uh, see a couple of examples how to design for torsion. Right, so we are uh, in the first part of this module uh, of uh, seven. And in this module, we are going to discuss about uh, introduction to torsion and then how behavior of RC members uh, subjected to torsion loading exhibits. Right. So the expected learning outcome are uh, students should be able to explain what is torsion and what are the different types of torsion that are available and uh, how to calculate a torsional shear stress in a solid and hollow sections and explain the failure modes of RC members subjected to torsion, uh, depending upon what type of theory that you're using. So different uh, modes of failure are possible and explain the behavior of uh, a reinforced concrete and plain concrete and what is the role of reinforcement in uh, resisting torsional loads and uh, explain again what are the combined action of torsion shear and flexion right so uh, we have discussed this uh, in the previous parts of the module in general the behavior of rc members can be categorized into four basic actions one is the axial load that can be compression or tension then you have bending then you have shear, then you have torsion, right? So these are the four basic actions that uh, acts on the RC members. Of course, stress resultants are six, uh, but the loading actions can be categorized them into four basic cases uh, because bending can be about both axes, shear, shear also can be in two directions and so on, right? So we are going to focus in this module on uh, how the members behave in torsion. Right, so you can see this uh, schematic uh, when a uh, square element is being subjected to uh, torque, then uh, torque can be defined or as a, a moment that is acting about the longitudinal axis of the member. Uh, a torque is an external applied load and the effect of that externally applied torque, you get twisting moment along the length of the member, which is an internal force. Just like in your, in your bending, you have uh, moment is external force, but bending moment is uh, due to that action of your external moment. So similarly, torque is an external force and twisting moment is basically uh, the variation of your uh, twisting moment along the length of the member. So you can see here, uh, we, are, we are talking about uh, applying a uh, twisting about the longitudinal axis of the member. So a twisting moment or a torque can be uh, said as a moment acting about the longitudinal axis of the member. Now, if I take a cross section, if I look at the shear stress distribution, you would find that uh, the shear stress distribution would be zero at the center. However, if I go uh, to the uh, outside surface of the cross section, you will find that the shear stresses are going to keep increasing. However, at corner, you will find that the shear stress again goes to zero and it becomes somewhat, if I, if I draw the shear stress distribution again along the diagonal, you will find that corner, you will have zero shear stress and then it will increase somewhere in the middle and then again, it will go back to zero at the center. However, if I'm looking at the mid surface of one of the mid, mid side of one of the faces, then you'll find that the shear stress are going to be maximum there and then it is going to become zero there. We will explain what are the reasons why you get this kind of shear stress, but you can see that the shear stress distribution, uh, it changes also along the periphery of your cross section for a, a rectilinear sections like square or non-circular sections, we can call it. Right, so uh, torsion, we have two types of torsion. Uh, one is the equilibrium torsion. And equilibrium torsion is, is the torsion that is induced by the eccentric loading 
with respect to the shear center of the cross section and using only statics that is equilibrium conditions we should be able to determine the twisting moments okay so you really don't need to invoke any of the compatibility conditions to find what is the twisting moment along the length of the member so one simple example is your uh, this kind of a cantilever roof shell so you can see that whatever the load that are there that is going to be transferred to this beam okay so this is the beam that we are talking about as a twisting moment okay so whatever the moment uh, the load that is acting on this cantilever roof shell will basically act as a um, twisting moment along the length of this beam that will be subjected to uniformly uh, about twisting moment if you look at the variations you are going to have a linear variations of your twisting moment okay so uh, this is one case so to determine what is the twisting moment that is acting on this beam i don't need to invoke any compatibility conditions only from static equilibrium conditions i should be able to find out what is the uh, twisting moment that is acting along the length of this beam so such kind of torsion is called as equilibrium torsion so um, right so you can see here uh, next case is a cantilever beam with an eccentrically applied load so you can see here that so this is the longitudinal 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 axis of the beam and you are applying a load at an eccentricity e so that is going to if you look at it at the end end of this beam if i uh, if i invoke that system of equal and forces you will find that this end of this beam will be subjected to a let's say if this load is p will be subjected to a torsional moment of p into e in addition to that it is also going to be subjected to some load p at the end of the beam right so this beam we are looking at this is the beam that we are looking at so that beam if i look at it so this beam will be subjected to a, a twisting moment like this in addition to that it will also be subjected to a load so this t will be equal to p into e so that is what we are trying to say so let's say this beam as a and b and c so we are looking only at a b here okay so this would be the total uh, force that is acting on this uh, beam a b okay. similarly in case of the precast systems you can have uh, for example if you span let's say you have this kind of an inverted uh, beam okay which are usually common with this beam this inverted beam will run along the columns then you have precast elements that come and sits on this ledge okay which is this the lower flange okay if your spans are going to be different in left and right direction then you can create a twisting moment to this precast inverted tv okay so these are all this is uh, again to find out what is the uh, twisting moment that is acting along this beam i i, I don't need any compatibility conditions i you know i i can you find out only from your equilibrium condition so these kind of torsion we call them as equilibrium torsion we have another type of torsion which is called as compatibility torsion and uh, it is actually induced by the need for the member to undergo an angle of twist to maintain deformation compatibility okay for example this is a very classical example you have a a primary girder here like this this is coming running along the length of your uh, along the column okay now to reduce the span of the slab then what we also do is we, we add these secondary beams which are uh, these are your secondary beams okay so which are added so that you know you can reduce the span of the slab to reduce the thickness of the slab so we know that in residential construction the thickness of the slab uh, the dead weight is a significant load if you want to reduce the dead load uh, one effective way is to reduce the thickness of the slab so we generally put this kind of secondary beams now when the loads are getting applied uh, in this joint the secondary beams are going to be in bending and now because the secondary beam is connected to this transverse girder the main girder so depending upon the torsional stiffness of the main girder that runs along the primary beam which is runs along the column 
and the flexural stiffness of the secondary beam, you will generate, you will transfer uh, moments uh, that will be twisting moment which are going to be running along this primary beam. So, okay, so for example, if you see here, this is your primary beam. Primary beam and this is your secondary beam. Now you can see that this joint you have two members that are connecting. One is the primary beam CD and the secondary beam AB. Now the secondary beam is going to undergo if I have let's say a load of P that is applied in the uh, span of secondary beam that is going to undergo bending. But however in the joint it is connected by the primary beam CD which is actually undergoing twisting. So now how much moment that I transfer actually depends upon what is the connectivity of the reinforcement that I gave. Okay. Or even if I put some nominal reinforcement as a top reinforcement, after a certain point of time, it is going to crack and it will allow rotation. So you can actually limit the amount of torsion that you are transferring to your primary beam. So depending upon how you do, how you design that connection. In fact, uh, if I don't have any reinforcement, if this uh, secondary beam is just simply sitting on this primary beam CD, then there will not be any twisting moment that will be transferred to this primary beam CD. Only the shear will be transferred. So it is actually up to the design engineer how we want to design that connection. Okay. So, depending upon how I detail and design that connection, I can transfer a large amount of torsion or I don't really need to transfer any torsion. So, so that this type of torsion is what we call that as a compatibility torsion. As we can see, it is induced by the need for the member to undergo an angle of twist to maintain deformation compatibility. And again, the resulting twisting moment depends upon the torsion stiffness of the member. In fact, most of the time, uh, these kind of secondary beams are designed as a simply supported condition without any transferring any moment. The code actually allows us to design like that. Because usually uh, the torsional stiffness of the member right after cracking, it is going to degrade significantly. Unlike your flexural stiffness, still you will have some stiffness. But in torsion, the moment you have the spiraling cracking that is forming, irrespective of the amount of reinforcement that I put, the torsional stiffness will degrade quite significantly. So that is the reason for compatibility torsion, the code allows uh, the design engineer to do what they want. So for example, if wherever possible, you can eliminate the torsion by reducing the redundant resistance. So I can actually model this joint at A to be a pinned connection in my modeling. Or in other words, in my structural analysis, when I'm doing uh, analysis, I can use a very low torsion stiffness so that you will not get any twisting moment in the primary beam. So that's what the code says. No specific design for torsion is necessary, provided the torsional stiffness is neglected in the calculation of internal forces. So that means what? If I put this primary beam torsional stiffness as very, very low or near to zero, then you will not get any twisting moment. The joint will become automatically like a hinge joint only. Uh, only your shear force will be getting transferred. So there are two types of torsion, equilibrium torsion, which is arising to satisfy the equilibrium condition, which we cannot ignore in our design. So that you cannot violate equilibrium condition. So that has to be accounted for in your design. However, when torsion is induced by the necessary to maintain the deformation compatibility, it is up to us to design how. Okay. So most often, for example, the design example that we given primary girder and secondary uh, beams. In fact, the joints are modeled as a pin condition. So you will not uh, transfer any torque to the primary girder. Because why is the reason? Of course, when you do that, there is a cost that you're going to pay. You're going to allow a lot of rotation and a lot of cracking. So to make sure that the crack widths are limited, so the code is uh, will require us to design some minimum transverse reinforcement and longitudinal reinforcement in those joints so that even if after cracking it is going to act like a pin but 
the cracks are not going to be very significant. Okay, so now we'll see the examples of practical examples of uh, torsion cups. Okay, so this is one example of a, a bridge which is an integrally connected bridge. That means the column, if you see here, this column is directly connected to this bridge deck. So it's not simply supported. So, and this is also curved bridge. And you know that if this kind of bridges are located in seismic active regions, uh, these will be subjected to earthquake motion. So, you will end up transferring some uh, torsional twisting moment. Okay, so the main reason is this. For example, if you see here, if I look at a simple this bridge, which is integrally connected with the column that is integrally, integrally connected with the bridge deck, you will find that uh, often the, there is going to be an eccentricity between the center of mass and center of rigidity. So that is going to create this twisting of this deck, which in turn it is going to create twisting moment or torque to this column. So these columns can be subjected to torque in these kind of scenarios, okay? especially in case of an integral bridge like the one that we are discussing here. Another example is in case of a skewed bridges, most often uh, due to the site constraints, uh, skew bridges are designed. You always cannot design a straight bridge. So skew bridges are one where you have a bridge deck that is at an inclined angle to the column bed. So like the one that you see here, so this is the one. So this is the uh, skewed bridge. So why torsion comes in a skewed bridges? Uh, again, uh, for some reasons, let's say the bridge deck is moving and uh, you have a bridge deck and this is your abutment. Okay, so this is an abutment that what we are talking about. Okay, now again these superstructure will be connected to this structure substructure like a bridge bend in the form of bearings. Okay, so in bearings you have fixed bearings and movable bearings. So fixed bearing will not allow any rotations or translations. So if bridge bends have some fixed bearings, uh, then during an uh, let's say an earthquake motion your skewed bridge deck can collide with the abutment and when it is colliding with the abutment and it is going to create these kind of impact forces these impact forces in addition it will create an eccentricity with respect to the uh, the center line of your bridge uh, bridge bent okay which this this is actually a bridge bent we call it this is a two column bridge bent so this is a bridge bent okay so if these forces are creating an eccentricity with respect to this bridge bend then it is going to twist this bridge bend and subject it to a torsional moment so this is again another case where uh, you don't have simply only bending and shear you will also have a torsional moment will be subject these bridge bends will be subjected to torsional moment. so this we need to account for them in our design. So, okay, this is not coming from your compatibility. This the forces are getting transferred, and then the equilibrium condition has to be satisfied. So, this will become a equilibrium torsion that we have to account for them in our design. Another classical case is you have a outrigger bent of a bridge. That means bridge bent will go out like this, and then it will connect. So, if I look at this kind of an outrigger uh, girder. You will find that again during an earthquake action, you have these kind of longitudinal forces that are developed in the bridge deck that has to be resisted by this reaction that are developed in this foundation. Okay, so in such case, if the applied force is not exactly at the center, which will be the case in case of an outrigger bend, then you will have these beams that will be subjected to significant amount of torsion which we need to account for them in our design. So you will have these uh, the horizontal beam in the uh, bridge bend will be subjected to twisting mode. So that has to be accounted for in design. So yeah, these are some bridge circular columns. Uh, they were tested under different combinations of torsion and bending. In fact, these are the columns that I had tested as part of my PhD. And you can see this is the first column. And these are all cantilever columns like this. Okay, And they were subjected to loading like this. Okay, Let's say this is P. 
and these bridge columns also had some axial compression. Now, this kind of column can be subjected to only bending and shear or combinations of bending, shear and torsion. And what we are seeing is from left to right is this is a column that was subjected to only pure uh, bending and shear without any torsion. And this is a column at the end which was subjected to only pure torsion without any uh, bending or shear force. So you can see that when you have a column that is subjected to pure torsion, the entire thing is subjected to same amount of torsion twisting and you can see that the failure mode has extended for the entire length of the column. But if it is a cantilever which is subjected to bending and shear, depending upon the amounts of bending and shear, in these columns uh, they are subjected to low shear and very high bending. So that is the reason you get a nice plastic hinge and you form uh, the failure mode which is going to dissipate a lot of energy during an earthquake. However, when your torsion levels are increased for the same columns and it were tested at different levels of torsion to bending, you will find that the failure mode is getting amplified. So even a small amount of torsion when it is present, it is going to increase the damage and increase the length of your damage zone which we have to properly account for in our design. So now let's look at uh, some uh, classical cases, how different sections are going to behave under torsion. So this is a very classical case of a circular bar. And if the circular bar are discretized as uh, different longitudinal lines and different radial lines, and uh, this is the way it is going to be. So this is the case of an antiform. When it is undergoing twisting, you will find that these all these sections, the circular lines, okay, they are just going to rotate, okay. However, you will find that the longitudinal lines will get twisted. So, they are not going to remain straight, they are going to get straight. However, the radial lines are going to remain straight, just like we had in bending plane sections remain plane. Here also, in circular sections, what you will find is the section will just going to rotate and uh, 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 the long, in that process, the longitudinal uh, lines will become twisted. So, this is how a, the circular section becomes. So, uh, using your basic strength of materials, we can show that uh, you, will get, you will have maximum shear stress at the periphery of the circular cross section. And if you look at the stress state, if I am taking a small element like this and then I am looking at it, you will have stresses, shear stresses that are going to form like this, right? And then it is going to form like this, and this is going to form like this. However, these are pre surfaces. You will not have any shear stresses. So, shear stresses will be only on these four planes. Top and bottom, you will not have any shear stress. Okay. Similarly, if I take this small element here, you will find the shear stress. This is a pre surface. Again, pre surface. You will not have any shear stress. So, we know that. And for the applied torque, so the resistance comes from all these shear stresses. If I take shear multiplied by this distance, shear multiplied by this elemental area over it is acting, multiplied by the distance, it will give me when I integrate over the entire cross section, I will I, that has to be equal to the external applied torque. Now, again, if you look at it, uh, this is how we get your maximum shear stress, it's going to be. T multiplied T is the applied torque and R is your the maximum radius of the section from the central and then J is your polar moment of inertia. Okay, so this is the way we calculate your maximum shear stress. Similarly, how do we get the shear strain? Shear strain basically, if you look at it here, so let's say this is your original length of a small element when I'm taking. And this element, it has become, oh, if you look at it, so this element has become like this. It's going to just twist, okay? So that's what we saw. A radial line will remain radial, but longitudinal line will get twisted. So this is your gamma. That gamma shear strain is nothing but your R into theta by L. Or in general, we can also write that as a rho theta by L, where rho is depending upon from center, if you look at it, this will be the point distance of the 
uh, point where I'm considering this calculation. So the maximum uh, twist, we twisting strain is going to be at the, the radius, the at radius r. So the maximum strain is going to be r into theta by l, where theta is your angle of your twist. And uh, so from that, we can calculate your uh, shear strain like this. So shear stress is tau into r by j, and shear strain is r into theta by l. Now, depending upon the sectional shape, the way the members are going to behave under torsion is going to be different. So, in this case, we are looking at a circular solid section and it is an axisymmetric cross section. And when such kind of axisymmetric cross sections are undergoing twisting, then you will not have any warping or distortion. So, warping means the section will remain same and it is not going to have an any out of plane deformation. Okay. Now, what is distortion? Again, circular will remain circular. Uh, so, there will not be any change in your cross section shape. So, for an axisymmetric cross section, you will not have any warping, which is the out of plane deformation. And you will also have no distortion. That means the shape of your cross section will remain same. So, this is what we said. The longitudinal line will get twisted like this. And we can we can calculate this is your basically your theta twisting. Right. However, if I am taking a, a square cross section, for example, that what we have seen here, and this section is not actually axisymmetric, it is a non-axisymmetric cross section. So you will get warping and distortion. So we will find out why that is happening in the coming slides. Uh, so basically, warping is a out of plane deformation. So initially the plane remains like this. Now the plane will become like this. Okay. So you will have out of plane deformations along the longitudinal uh, axis. Okay. And similarly, the shape of the cross section will not re remain actually square. It will change. So uh, so non-axisymmetric cross section under torsion will undergo both warping as well as distortion. So the sectional shape will play a major role whether you are going to have only circulatory torsion, which is your St. Vinon torsion, or you will have warping torsion. Because the resistance also comes from, depending upon how the section is warping, the resistance also coming from this. So that kind of torsional resistance, we call that as warping torsion. And then if it, the section is just rotating uh, and the, uh, the resistance offered for that rotation is basically your circulatory torsion, or also called as St. Vinon torsion. So there are resistance, you can classify them as St. Vinon torsion and warping torsion. Now let's see how the rectangular sections uh, they behave. Again, uh, we have seen that. So uh, if, if you discretize this rectangular member, member as a horizontal and uh, a vertical lines, and you will find that uh, now you will find that not only this horizontal, sorry, the, uh, the horizontal lines are getting twisted like this, but you will find that the vertical lines are also not remaining straight and it is undergoing change in its shape. So this is what we are saying that the non-circular sections are going to have both warping as well as distortion. Now when you look at the, uh, the cross section, as we have discussed in the very first slide, you will find that the maximum shear stress is going to be at the mid surface. Okay, let's see. This this is your mid surface. At this mid surface of a longer side, you will have maximum shear stress. However, when I look at this corner, you will find that the shear stresses are going to become zero, and it will be maximum somewhere. If I take a diagonal line, you will have maximum shear stress somewhere in the middle of the diagonal line. However, at the corner locations, you will find that the shear stresses are zero. Now, why is that the shear stresses are zero here? Okay. So if you look at this phase, you will find maximum shear stress like this. That is the distribution that we got. Again, this is a, a free surface. Okay. So if you look at it here, the shear stresses on all the planes has to be zero in corners. Okay. So to satisfy the shear stress, okay, now the element has to undergo some rigid body rotation. Okay, so because of that, only we are getting warping. 
okay so you will find that the shear stress is everywhere it has to be zero okay because otherwise it cannot satisfy the equilibrium you will not you will develop for every shear you will have a complementary shear so that uh, because it's a free surface at these two corners so these two has to be zero so if these two has to be zero again the complementary shear also has to be zero that is the reason the corner element you will have zero shear stresses okay again to satisfy the zero shear stress conditions the element has to undergo some rotation which is along the uh, because everything is going to undergo rigid body rotation so when it is undergoing because the shear strain also has to be zero so if the shear strain is zero then the element has to satisfy the compatibility it has to undergo some rigid body rotation that is going to create some warping so that warping we have to account for them uh, in when we calculate okay so in nutshell for non circular sections you are going to have warping and distortion of your cross section shape so uh, and the resistance also comes from when the section is undergoing warp okay so uh, non circular sections will resist the applied torque by saint vinon torsion which is a circulatory torsion in addition to that you are also going to have resistance because of the warping process which is a warping torsion now now from analysis point of view let's say we talked about this primary girder primary beam and secondary beam in a residential construction right so how to estimate the torsion stiffness okay so in a usual linear elastic analysis of structures the torsion stiffness kt which is basically torsion stiffness any stiffness if you look at it is force required to produce unit deformation so here it is a torque required to produce unit twist okay so for a particular length it's given by g into c by l c is your cross sectional property and g is your shear modulus l is your length of your member just like in flexure you will find that the flexural rigidity is actually ei by l depending upon the boundary conditions you will have some constant k whether it is going to be 4 1 or 3 depending upon the boundary condition this is for flexural stiffness similarly for torsional stiffness it is going to be g c by l just like your moment of inertia you are you have this c which is a saint vinon torsional constant and g is your shear modulus which usually we take it as 0.4 times your elastic modulus of pocket and you all know that ec can be sorry ec can be calculated as 5000 square root of fc it's a material property okay so we can calculate that and c which is uh, constant which can be taken as 0.5 times k where k is your appropriate saint vinon torsional constant and k is measured just like your moment of inertia it's a sectional property k is measured as beta b cube d and beta is 1 minus 0.63 b by d by 3 so this were all uh, derived by saint vinon uh, based on some semi, semi inverse approach based on his experiment and from theoretical considerations he derived for different sections this uh, beta factor which they are called as saint vinon torsional constant 